Sea of Red, it's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. The Flames have officially hit the halfway point, and they are once again sitting in a wildcard spot. I'm Dan alongside Matt, and we're ready to talk Flames hockey. The Chicago game just ended, and uh, Matt, let's work backwards this game. Um, we'll, yeah. we'll, we'll taper our, our disappointment a little bit. The Flames started off the week with a loss as well, a 3-2 loss to the Jets on January 3rd. Uh, what was your thoughts on this one? Oh, this game basically is a typical Winnipeg Jets game where it's a close game that's usually a one-goal game either way. And this time, uh, Hellebuck was the better goalie. And I didn't feel that Markstrom really uh, made any high-end saves in this one. Uh, You know, not that like he had a ton of ability to stop any of the three goals, but you're you're needing your goalie to do a little bit more than just, you know, stopping the pucks that you're supposed to stop. And, you know, it's one of those, it was a fairly even game between the two teams, and the decision went to the goaltenders, and Calgary came out on the losing end. Why do you think there's such problems with the Jets? Uh, they're a big team, mostly. Um, they're and they're skilled. It, you know, it, it it doesn't really matter which team goes up against Winnipeg. Winnipeg doesn't tend to get blown out very often, and they also don't tend to blow out anybody very often. It's they're very much one of those middle of the road, solid but unspectacular teams. And you know, Calgary just it, you could pretty much put the same label on the Flames in a lot of ways. Um, just, yeah, it's just one of those games and it just seems like every time I think about them, I think of either a close win or a close loss. Yeah. And you can even go back like four or five, six, seven years. And it's been pretty much the same thing, uh, where like it usually ends up being a late goal in the last five minutes that ends up deciding the game or in overtime and. You know, there was like five and a half minutes when uh, Sam Gagne scored the winner in this one. And yeah, it, it's unfortunate that the Flames came out on the losing end, but it it's not really a surprising result because we tend to trade those games back and forth every year. And then the next game of the week, much better result for the Flames. The uh, New York Islanders came and visited us in the Saddle Dome and the Calgary Flames got off to a big start here, a 3 nothing start. And end up getting the four to one win. Yeah, Calgary. Uh, you know, they they didn't get a lot of shots in this game, and I, I think they only had twenty one, which was the second fewest they've had all year. And to me, it was a better game for them. <laughs> um, I thought that um, instead of dumping the puck on the goaltender from various points in the actual offensive zone the team was focused especially in the first 10 15 minutes of the game on generating more higher danger scoring chances and even though they weren't getting a ton of shots they did score three right off the bat and you know, yeah this, it, was a, it, this was a tough one for me because i don't know if the flames really played all that good of a game no it, it was a very odd game frankly like it wasn't like the islanders did anything right in the game and it's not like calgary did anything overtly bad but it's like neither team really like it was a boring game frankly like the, it you know like neither team generated much of anything in terms of excitement but uh, calgary at least uh was able to more concentrate their efforts into good scoring chances when they had the opportunities to do so and basically managed the clock and frustrated the Islanders through to the win. Nice see Lucic get a goal here. And uh, one thing, uh, Daryl Sutter said a lot this year that you can take, what is it, three penalties or less a game, and this one the Flames only had to kill one penalty, which I think is is really a testament to, um, you know, how well, and again, I want to say how well they played, because I don't know they played all that well here, but maybe how disciplined they played is a better way to say it. Yeah, well, and I think that's been a focus of this team, like especially after getting lit up by Edmonton a couple of times. 
uh, to focus on maintaining discipline. And even if you move ahead to the next game, Calgary did not take too many penalties in that contest either. And even though they did end up losing that one in overtime. Well, let's uh, let's talk about that one. So this is the game that just ended. We're recording on the 8th, at just moments after the Chicago game. And this was a game that the Flames should have won. I mean, they're playing the, the worst team in the league. Patrick Kane was out for this one. So even more reason that we should win. And somehow the Flames uh, managed to have to go to overtime and even then lost in this one. Yeah, this one... I'm firmly putting the goat horns on uh, uh, Jacob Markstrom. Um, frankly, uh, he was not prepared for the game, uh, I thought, and I thought all three of the goals that he surrendered, he could have at least made an attempt to stop the pucks. And, like, especially that third goal, like, my immediate reaction was get that guy off the, the ice. Like, he doesn't care. Like, you know, you don't even make any movement across on the pass. You know, I don't care if your attempt is going to be futile. Ultimately, you still have to have the responsibility to your teammates to at least make the attempt, not just, oh, well, they, they got to tap in. And, like, to me, like, that goal there, I wouldn't start marks from for a couple of games after that. And Daryl seemed like he was upset when he pulled Markstrom in that one. I don't know if he was just upset with Markstrom or the situation, but he was pretty upset when when uh, Vladar was going in. Yeah, and you know, to be frank, like uh, that's not to excuse the rest of the Flames. Like they played terribly uh, for most of the game uh, when they the Blackhawks had the puck. Like how many high quality scoring chances did Chicago have in that one? You know, and to be fair, you know, like, it, Vladar, he didn't face very many shots, but, like, basically every one of them was a high-danger scoring chance. And, you know, it's he's literally the only reason why the Flames managed to get a point. Like, if Mark Sturm was in for the whole game, it's probably 7-3 for Chicago final. But, you know, it, it's one of those where... Like it, you need sometimes you need your goalie to bail you out when you're having a bad game, to at least to start to settle things down. And other times, you, you know, you're you need to pick up your goaltender when he's doing. But it's like everybody was on their own page and nobody was helping out anybody. I think that's fair to say, yeah. And uh, yeah, I don't like, know. I mean, this is like they literally got the point just because they actually have NHL talent versus Chicago, who's basically spare parts you know and like chicago's legitimately a terrible hockey club that has maybe like five legit nhl players on the team and then a bunch of guys that are you know jockeying for jobs moving forward and you know like there is absolutely no reason the flames should have lost and you even look back in the blackhawks recent games like they've they're only two wins in their last ten are against the Arizona Coyotes and the Columbus Blue Jackets, which, you know, frankly makes sense because those two teams are also equally terrible. But, you know, it, it's just not acceptable. Like, you know, Calgary is not ten points up on second place, where they can casually throw away a point here and there in the standings. Like, the, you know, like this game could literally be the difference between the Flames making the playoffs and not. You know, you you can't be this casual. Period. Yeah, I think that's fair. I think that's yeah. definitely fair to say. I don't know, like I don't know what to say about this one. I'm glad that the Flames walk away with a point. Maybe is the you know the best way to say it. But yeah, at the same I agree. Time, they they should have two points. So you know, I, I think if they walked away with zero points, that would be a huge failure. But oh, this yeah, is one sure. that I don't think anybody's going to be happy with. No, and. You know, like, this is one of those games where, you know, if we're talking, like, 20 years ago, like, the coach would be bag skating him the next day. And, you know, like, it, it, you know, because, like, if you're not willing to put the effort in, in the game, then you can skate the next day until you puke, basically. And it, it's one of those things that, like, this team should know by now what they need to do to actually beat bad teams. And, like, this was just a horrible effort all the way around. Yeah, I, I mean, yeah, you're right. It, it was not not the effort they needed. And, yeah, it's 
And like it, it's hard to like find positives. Like, yeah, like I'm, that's I guess why I'm not saying much because I'm trying to think of a positive here. I guess the positive they got less penalty minutes than Chicago and won the faceoff dot. Like this should have been yeah. a game that you know you yeah. you scheduled in as two points, and the fact that the Flames only walk away with one, it's it's disappointing. No, and you look at like previous gimme games like the Columbus Blue Jackets game earlier this year. Uh, you know, like between those two, like that that's the difference between us and being pretty much close to being tied with LA in the standings if you just win those two games, which should be gimmies. But instead we're way back now and you know, just deletes another game off the schedule. Which, you know, there's 40 games left, one game's left. Like, there's plenty of time to make it up still. But, you know, that clock is starting to tick down now. And Well, and that's it. At what point important. do you start saying, you know, we're running out of time to make it up, or we can't make it up? Yeah. And, you know, like, it's getting to a point, like, Vegas is still technically catchable. Uh, especially with Vegas falling back lately. And... Like the division isn't out of reach, but you actually have to string together some wins to, you know, get yourself back in that conversation. And instead, you know, you're throwing away an opportunity to make up games, really. And like the one benefit from our division is, like, frankly, all of the teams except for Vegas are frankly terrible in different ways. So. You know, if the Flames finish second or third in the division, they're going to get a relatively mediocre opponent compared to some of the other teams. Uh, but th this shouldn't be acceptable, period. Well, let's talk about the standings here. So the Flames uh, get two losses, one win this week, and that puts them at 48 po 46 points. Sorry, They've played 41 games, have 19 wins, 14 losses, and 8 overtime losses for a total of 46 points. Edmonton is right below us at 45. Seattle is in the third spot in the Pacific. They have three games at hand, and they're at 48 points. LA has 52, and Vegas 56. So we were in that Pacific division, I guess, top three last week when we've fallen down to the wild card. Yeah, and, you know, to be honest, like, the Flames, like, over the next few months, like, I was looking ahead at the Flames schedule, and basically there's one six-game segment at the end of February, beginning of March, where they play six good teams in a row. But, like, before and after that, like, the quality of teams up to that point and after that are, we're basically playing two-thirds against really bad teams like the Chicago's of the NHL. Where like this is Chicago. where, you know, you you should be making up your points now. Like you know, you've got through the hard part of your schedule. Now it's the easy part. You actually have to show up and actually beat these teams. And instead, like the, they played down to Chicago's level, which I didn't even know was possible, frankly, with how bad the Blackhawks are, and managed to find a way to lose. Yeah, and you know, I mean, I'm trying. I'm really trying, Matt, to find something positive about this game. And the only thing I can think is maybe this is the maybe this is what the team needs to smarten up. And I'm I guess I'm hoping that in the end, because if you can't beat Chicago and you don't learn from that, there's gonna be a lot more pain for this team down the road. No, you look at Chicago, right? And through thirty eight games coming into tonight, they had only scored eighty two goals. So like they're just a hair over two goals a game. And they're without their best player. And you somehow managed to give up four goals. It's like, yeah, they're terrible, but they're still an NHL team. And, like, the, just the lack of respecting the fact that, you know, they still actually have NHL players, even though they're terrible... You know, it, it's just like a lack of maturity from this team, which we've said year in, year out, that they they just seem to not show up for games against, like, the really lousy teams. Like, earlier this year against Buffalo, like, they got caught with their pants down in that one when Buffalo had the reputation of being really bad. 
And it, it's just, it get, comes to a point where, like, this kind of stuff is not acceptable. And you guys have to be more accountable to each other to be better. And, you know, like, Manjapane had three really good opportunities in this game to score a goal. It, and, like, last year he would have had a three, two or three goal game, frankly, in this one. For where he was on the ice and the type of shot and space he had. And instead, he only managed to get one puck on the net, and it was an easy shot to the guy's breast bread basket. And it's like, you know, yeah, you're supposed to actually, you know, you're getting paid $6 million a season to score goals. You know, at some point, you have to actually show up. And You had mentioned Jacob Marks from earlier. Yeah. Um, and, you know, him not looking, in your opinion, great in the Chicago game. We've struggled with Markstrom all year. He started the year very inconsistent. As we know, the Flames took him out for a while after he was down on himself and said he wasn't good at hockey, and Dan Vladar got the net. They've given Markstrom the net again recently. Do you feel like maybe Markstrom just had a bad game or two, or do you think that he really hasn't turned that corner and we need him to turn in order to be the, the solid 1A for this team? Yeah, I don't feel that he's actually stepped up much at all. Uh, he's had a couple of good games since the beginning of December when he got the net back. But ever since then, it's very sporadic. And the the Flames, when they, they're winning games, most of the time it's in spite of his efforts. And like he's making the routine saves, which at the beginning of the year, he wasn't even doing that. But he has been poor as a goalie uh, thus far this season. And... You know, like, the guy that I would compare him most to is uh, the 2015-16 version of Jonas Hiller, where it's, you know, it worried about any shot going towards the net. And, like, today was an example of that, where, you know, like, any time Chicago had any sort of opportunity, like, the puck, you know, like, he would make maybe the first save, but, like, the, the rebound that he kicked out in the second goal... Like, no NHL goalie should be kicking a puck out into the center of the ice like that. And yet, you know, right on the guy's stick for a tap-in. And they're just, for whatever reason, he just mentally does not seem with it right now. And frankly, like, his giving up on the third goal, like, to me, it's like, get out of the net for a while. Again, like, let Vladar start, like, eight or nine out of the next ten games. And, you know, come back at the end of the month and maybe you can get a game or two to see if you, you've checked back in. Because, you know, like he's letting his team down. Yeah, and you need you need good goaltending if we're going to go deep in the playoffs. I agree about Marks from not looking good here. I don't know that they'll go right to Vladar. I think with two games against St. Louis, you give each goalie one of them just to give St. Louis a different look is my guess. But... Yeah, I would say maybe, you know, give Vladar the majority of the month. And Matt, I think, you know, if I'm Dan Vladar right now, I might be looking at this as a prime chance to win a job. It's so hard to win yeah. a job in the NHL. Yeah. But there, to me, there's a job to be won now. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, Vladar is the right age where he can legitimately become a starting goaltender in this league. And basically, uh, other than like the first or second games that he started at the beginning of the year where both guys were kind of bad, like he's been lights out ever since. And like today's game, the Flames owe the point they got literally to him robbing the Blackhawks on four or five occasions. And, you know, it, it it's one of those that, you know, like we're getting to a point where like you can't screw around with things anymore and you know like literally piss points away like tonight's game and you know there has to be a, a point in the season where you, you you gotta just stop with any excuses okay time to put up or shut up and Markstrom to this point hasn't Vladar has you gotta go with the guy that's actually performing and contracts be damned yeah and I guess it's it's so weird because Vladar looks so, or sorry, Markstrom looked so good last year, but you know, he's had inconsistencies throughout his time in Vancouver and things like that. But right now, I mean, I feel like if you can't solve these problems by this point in the year, you've got to make a different decision. 
Yeah. I'm not saying uh, trade the guy, but maybe Dan Vladar needs the net for a bit longer. Yeah, and you know, you can easily reverse the roles where uh, you know, instead of like uh Vladar getting two out of every seven games, make it the other way around. And you know, run with that for a while until you know, cuz like frankly, like if Mark St- or Vladar had started this game, the Flames win. And in my you know, I, I firmly believe that. You have to set yourself up uh, with your best chance to win, and right now, putting Vladar in net gives you that. And until he proves otherwise, and, you know, he's basically been lights out all year, and he's been playing as good as Markstrom was a year ago. And for whatever reason, Markstrom has not been cutting it. Yep. And, and you know, it, and I'm not... Uh, you know, I'm not disappointed in Markstrom or, you know, like, oh, let's trade him or buy him out or this or that or whatever. He needs to figure out how to get himself up for games where he's involved properly and can actually do the things that he knows he can do, we know he can do, and has done for many years. It's just, for whatever reason, he's getting in his own way at this point. And... You know, he needs time to work that out. And when you have a guy that's actually playing well, it kind of gives the Flames some space to allow Markstrom to figure that out. It, you know, if Ladar was playing poorly, then, you, you know, the Flames are, you know, we're probably having a different conversation of, like, is this team going to make the playoffs because the goaltending is bad? Or do you trade for a goalie at the trade deadline or something? Yeah, and if but, they were both playing bad now, I think you probably would have given Wolf a, a shot. Yeah, and you know it, it it's just frustrating because of the fact that, um, you know, it, we've seen him at his best, and we know what he can do. Like he went toe to toe with Jake Ottinger last year and won. Like he can play that good. It's just for whatever reason. You know, he just can't seem to click it over uh, thus far this year, and it's getting too late in the season to be worried about that whole situation. You know, the Flames need to move on and, you know, dedicate each game to actually winning it instead of, you know, trying to guide players along uh, in hopes that they figure it out, like Manjapane, like him getting settled on the third line has been appropriate for where he's been playing this year. And, you know, the Flames need to move on from him as a top six forward for the time being until he can show that he is and, you know, address things as if he's just the third line. Kind of a a lot of guys slumping right now. Yeah. And it's up to the guys to start putting up. And, like, we're seeing guys like Kadri and Huberdo starting to come into their own and, you know, reestablishing themselves as a first line. And, you know, you're waiting for the other guys that have been struggling all year to show up too. And uh, by and large, they haven't. And, you know, Markstrom and Manjapane both have been number one on that list together as players that have severely underperformed. And that's okay. It's just that the team needs to you know, make ice time and roster adjustments accordingly. And, you know, it's not a slight on them. It's just that, you know, the team is dedicated to actually winning. And, you know, it, like they're all in for to try and win over the next three or four years. You can't have passengers that are not showing up. <laughs> yep, I think that's well said. I mean, this one we've talked about for a while and... Yeah, it's starting to really come to the forefront. Yeah, it, and like it, it's as you said, it's been coming for a while. But like today was like a big slap in the face, you know, where it's like, uh, okay, you know, like you should be manhandling this team, and literally none of you can show up properly. Like, well, and I think you know we gave the team some leeway at the beginning of the season to figure things out and get a new you know, a new group together and that sort of thing. But now 41 games in, I mean, and, and we talked about it last week. Let's, let's remember that the team is not that different of a spot from where we were this time last year. But even then, I mean, we've got to kind of look at them and say, this team needs to be better. 
Yeah. And some guys are definitely responding. Like Huberdeau is playing his best hockey this season, the last 10, 15 games. Same with Kadri. And, you know, the first line's performing well most nights. Backlund and Coleman are coming into it. Like most of the guys are doing well. You just need the other components of the team to step up. And right at this point, you, they're not. And that that's the worrying part, part because you need to have, like, you can't have huge parts of your team just not playing at an adequate level. And, you know, like it, Markstrom, frankly, like if Markstrom was playing even like 80, 90% of how he was last year, like the flames are probably up near where Vegas is right now, but we keep continually letting points go just because he's in net as the de facto starter. And, you know, frankly, if the flames want to make the playoffs or possibly have home ice advantage, uh, in the first round, like they have to start making decisions to actually put the best team on the ice. And, you know, unfortunately Markstrom's not the guy right at the moment. Well, a guy who is doing well, and you mentioned his name a few times, is Nazem Kadri. He was named in this new all-star format the league rolled out as the Calgary Flames representative for the all-star game. So in the past, I mean, we've seen all sorts of wacky all-star formats. Remember when it was North America versus the world and stuff like that? And yeah. and and now we're seeing where in the past, it's been what, like 10 years since the fans have voted in the entire team, I think? Yeah. Because um, there was a while that we... We voted for the guys, and then they were picked. Yeah, there's been all sorts of stuff. But this year, initial roster selections were made by the league's Department of Hockey Operations on January 5th and represent the first stage of the all-star player process with one player selected per team. The remaining 12 players will be decided by fan vote running from January 5th to January 17th uh, with fans voting for three players for each division. So as of now, Nazem Kadri will join uh, Matty Veneers, Kevin Fiala, Connor McDavid, Elias Pettersson, Troy Terry, Eric Carlson, and Logan Thompson as the uh, Pacific Division team. I think, you know, if you're going to pick a flame, I think he was the right choice, but what an odd way to do the All-Star game, like having the league just pick a guy from every team. Yeah, uh, I'm not really a fan of that. And they um, didn't release what their criteria was. Like, we don't know if these are just their favorites, if they were obviously not picking the highest score on every team. Like, it just seems weird. Yeah, like, even positionally, it was weird that they went with Kadri instead of Lindholm. Like, it, I, I can understand, like, wanting a center uh, for the team, but, it, you know, like if you're even p picking from the same position, I don't think that Kadri was better than Lindholm this year um, on the whole. So, it, you know, it just seemed really kind of random and more, like, for name recognition more than anything. Because, like, Kadri is a more well-known guy than Lindholm. And, yeah, it just, it, it I, I think it probably to has to do with media. I guess no, maybe not media, but Kadri was a Stanley Cup champ last year. I think he's probably got a bit more name value in the league. Yeah, I agree. It's just, it, it seems a little arbitrary. And, like, it... For an event like this, like I always dislike when the league kind of steps in. Uh, like it, frankly, it should just be a, a vote all the way around, and with like for the starters, and then like th them picking the back end guys. Uh, so that way, like each team has a representative, and you know, picking to fill spots that way instead of up front. Because, like, like, you just know, like, from our division that uh, Drysidel is going to get one of the three spots. And, you know, you're likely going to need another backup uh, goalie. Well, and, we have one defenseman right now. Yeah, and it's, like, it's just weird. Yeah, like, I, I just don't... And it seemed like it just came out of nowhere. Like, we had no idea what the All-Star format was. We just all assumed it was going to be the same. They yeah, hadn't and then, announced oh, anything, and, and then all yeah. of a sudden it was just, oh, it's different. And it makes me wonder if something changed last minute. Yeah, it's it just very odd. And when I look at these names, like I look at other divisions, we won't get into them all, but I mean, 
yeah, okay, the names make sense for, you know, sellable names in the league. And I think these are the names in a lot of cases that would have ended up making it anyways. I think the Pacific Division is maybe the weird one to me. Like, Troy Terry is an odd selection for me. Eric Carlson yeah. is an odd selection to me. Well, I can even understand Eric Carlson just because San Jose is a tire fire. Uh, but, uh, you know, like Troy Terry, like I, I would have assumed that uh, Zegras would have been the representative, if anybody. Yeah, I agree. Uh, you know, and it's just like even Seth Jones, like him getting the call, uh, like that to me didn't make any more sense. Like that should have really been Patrick Kane. And like Jones has not had that good of a season. And, you know, it's just everything with the, the all-star game is just weird this yeah, year. Yeah, like, uh, I, don't, I don't know. Even when I look at this, I probably would have picked a defenseman from L.A. just to sort of even things out. But, yeah, it's just, I don't know. The I, I don't know why they made the change last minute. But, I mean, I'm happy with Kadri as our pick. Frankly, the only other guy I could see making it, if the, any other guys make it, would be Rasmus Anderson. And even then, it's like a 5% chance. The only I, I thing... Think, the only thing I don't I think can, we're getting anybody else. No, I think that with where the Flames are, they're probably not going to get anyone on there, sadly. Even Anderson, I don't think, even if they want to fill a defenseman, I think there's bigger name defensemen I that would probably make it on there. The only thing I can think of, Matt, and I have no no knowledge of this, just what I've been thinking about since um, Kadri's name was announced, we've seen in the past maybe what the league looks at as a black eye of guys not wanting to go to the All-Star game, and I wonder if the league had every team submit a list of guys that had already committed they would go, and they just kind of picked from those guys. Could be. Because how often have we seen a guy get selected, and then last minute it's like, no, I don't want to go. Ovechkin? Uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, no, I know what you mean. and it, The whole thing's just weird, and, like, their whole method of announcing it's just odd. And... Yeah, like it it just rubs me the wrong way a bit just because of how co- like completely random. It, like it, there was no lead up there. It's not like normally like when they would do that, oh, you know, wait for this su- such and such day for our announcement for the All-Star starters and you know, like there wasn't any of that no, even, it was, it, and it, it just kind of came out go. of nowhere. It's just like, tonight we're yeah. announcing guys to the All-Star game. And, it, yeah, I don't know. The whole thing seems rushed, and I'm not sure why. Yeah, because especially when, like, frankly, like your All-Star game is supposed to be advertising your star players, you would think that you would be trying to make more media attention to it. And so anything like you know, announcing that, oh, we're going to announce our teams in like three days or, you know, next week or whatever, you know, stay tuned. You know, you'd think that something along those lines would have happened, not just, oh, well, they're coming out tonight and, you know, T minus two hours and Yeah, cool. I was very confused by the whole way this was handled. Yeah. Um, talking about another, you know, positive here, I guess after the Chicago game, I want to stay on the positives we can. A guy that I think has looked really good this past week was Blake Coleman. And I think Blake Coleman was brought into this team. I mean, if you look at the if you look at the contract, if you look at where he was put when he first came in, I think they probably looked at him as a I would say probably a second line winger. And he's spent time on the third line while he's been here and he's never been bad, but I feel like this week he's been playing probably his best hockey as a flame. Yeah, and you know, to be fair to him, like he, when he was with Tampa, he was their third line winger and played a very effective role. And with the depth that Tampa had, he was able to score a lot because of the fact that he was with two really good scorers as well. And, you know, Calgary um, at times has lacked scoring. And, he, you know, he's been having some difficulties finding that right chemistry. But, uh, you know, ever since Manjapane has gotten put on that line, him, Backlund, and uh, Coleman have all, all three of them have just taken off. And, you know, like Manjapane is playing probably his best of the season, but still not good enough for 
his, him as a player, but you know, it's good to see that Coleman's starting to chip in offensively more like he normally does and just playing the good 200 foot hockey that he normally does. Yeah. I, I just wanted to call him out cause I've noticed him quite a bit. I mean, he even scored a few, a few times this week. Um, he's just, he's looked really, I think really good as a flame. And I think you're right. Probably getting comfortable with his, um, with his line mates, getting comfortable with where he is in the roster, maybe what he's being asked to do. But in a in a weird week for the Flames, he's a guy that I've really noticed for the right reasons. So I just wanted I to, to put him out there. And I think, again, if the Flames are looking to try and get some things going, I could see Blake Coleman potentially being given a bigger role this week um, because he is one of those guys that's doing well. Yep, I agree. And I guess, Matt, the next thing we should probably talk about is the roster moves that were made. Before Calgary went on a on a plane to Chicago, they have a five-game road trip, so they are going Chicago, St. Louis, St. Louis, Dallas, Nashville. They made two call-ups. They called a Walker Doer and Jacob Peltier from the Calgary Wranglers. I said it right the first time. Um, and they placed, uh, first for either of us this that's season. That's right. Um, and I they placed Brett Ritchie on the IR. So... I mean, we've seen some call-ups already this season. Jacob Peltier, big deal. A lot of fanfare for that. Were you surprised that Peltier is with the team in Chicago but ended up being a healthy scratch? Yeah, yes and no. Like, I I would have assumed that uh, he would get played against the weak team um, from this week upcoming uh, just to get him some reps against well, frankly, his equal competition from the AHL. <laughs> uh, but, uh, yeah, for whatever reason, the Flames decided not to go that route. Um, I think uh, with uh, Phillips being recalled for so many days last month that uh, he's burning a lot of his uh, window of being up before needing waivers again. So the Flames need to manage his, uh, you know, like if you're going to call him up, call him up for good type of situation. And I don't think the Flames are quite at that point with Phillips. So it made perfect sense to do the same thing with Peltier and give him some time in NHL practices and perhaps getting a game or two on the trip. I can totally see bringing up Walker Dewar. If you just need an extra body for the road trip, I think Walker Dewar's, you know, he has some NHL experience, not a ton, but he has enough NHL experience that to replace Richie, he can definitely be your guy there. He can be that 13th forward. But, I, I mean, how long can you go on this trip until Peltier is in the lineup? Well, frankly, like after the performance that we just saw tonight, like I, I honestly would not be surprised if uh, – you know, both Peltier and Dewar drew in and some guys getting sat for a game. Uh, Who would you just take to, out? Uh, honestly, I would take out Andrew Mangiapane and uh, one of the fourth liners. It just See, I, I wonder if this is the time when we've talked about how Lucic is maybe playing above his head. I wonder if this is the time where you bring Lucic off the second line, put um, Peltier there, and move... Lucic back to that fourth line. And that's perfectly viable as well. But, um, yeah, it, it, it's just tough because of the fact that, like, so many guys have been kind of straddling that line of not being good enough right now. And I think, um, Manjapane, like, especially after that, uh, three good chances and one shot on net. Uh, performance by him that, uh, you know, him sitting for a game wouldn't be the worst idea. Um, you know, it, it's one of those that, like, a lot of guys need to snap out of it. And, you know, he's played better being on the third line, but that's still not good enough. And But at the same time, that line, as we just said, has been so good, that back in Coleman Mangiapane line, I don't know I want to touch it. Yeah, and th that's where, like, uh, Peltier is a very good two-way forward. Um, for anybody who's been watching the Wranglers, like, he's fairly good at both ends of the ice. So uh, he's been doing his job, and, like, he's earned this call-up. So, like, could he slot in as the third guy in that line? Yes, 
and it would basically be more or less like having Rujitska there, who's played well there in the past as well. So yeah, it, it's just uh, tough uh, because like you know, like if you're replacing say uh, Zahorna with uh, Doer, you're not really making any kind of real impact in the lineup where, you know, like, as you mentioned, like say moving Lucic to the fourth line, uh, that could do as well. Um, uh, I still feel that Lucic has been playing well enough to keep him on, uh, the second line. Like he set up the Huberto goal rather yeah, he got effectively a goal earlier this week too. So it's kind of like, you know, I don't think he's done with playing at the level that he's been playing at yet. I think you just kind of have to ride that situation out until, you know, either he sticks, which that would be hilarious, or, (laughs) you know, he regresses back to the way he has been for the first half of the season and you know, in which case then you can adjust him down in the lineup accordingly. Like, I think if we look at this, Dubé, Lindholm, Toffoli don't come out. No. Kadri, Huberto don't come out. No. Backlund, Coleman don't come out. No. There's no reason to take Lewis out of the lineup. He's an adequate fourth-line center. Yeah. So the guys that are left would be Lucic, Mangiapane, Rujicka, and Dewar. I mean, Rujicka's looking fine, but he's not looking spectacular right now. I think maybe you swap him out for Dewar. And that could work too. Like Rujitska, you know, he was hot early and then he got demoted somewhat unfairly at the time. And his level of play has dropped accordingly as he's dropped in the lineup. And, you know, I, just, I think he, I, I he needs see, to reset. I can't as see well. the Flames City Manjapani. No, I don't either, but, you know, it, it's. Sort of like last year when the Flames sat uh, Dubé for a couple of games just to give him a wake-up call. And I think that, you know, like with how manjapani has been playing, like, you know, he's a barely adequate third liner at this point. And that's, you know, not good, um, no, especially and, for $6 million. And if you're not going to take Lucic off the second line, like to me, that's the spot that's screaming for Peltier is that second line spot. Maybe you move Lucic to the third line with Backlund Coleman. But if you want to keep Lucic where he is, I think then you've got to take Monge out because you're not going to put Peltier on your fourth line. You're not putting him with Rujicka and Lewis. Well, you could, but that would be kind of pointless. That's a waste. Yeah. Why call him up to do that? So I, I don't think that's where they're going with this one. Yeah, the only reason I could see that is to ease him in. If you are planning on keeping him here permanently, then I could see sort of like when the Flames first brought Manjapane up and he played for like a half a season on the Flames' fourth line with Hathaway. Um, that, you know, like that could be an effective way to get him used to the NHL level, but I don't see the urgency... Uh, to, you know, shoehorn him in on the fourth line. At and this I point. think if that's your your goal at this point, you're better to keep him in the AHL. Yeah, I agree. Because he's kicking some butt down there and having him... Big fish know, in a small pond. Yeah, because let him finish out the season being confident while, while the Wranglers are, like, the best team in the league and, you know, see if they can't go for that Calder Cup instead of you know, being a shoehorned fourth line guy just because that's safe. Like I, like I said, I sort of understand bringing Dewar in, especially if the team is, you know, just need an extra body. I think sort of like Zahorna, he was the extra body. I don't think that Dewar is going to stick around here. I don't think he's NHL caliber, but, you know, why not bring him up? He's not going to be missed that much, I don't think, in Stockton right now. Um, but Peltier, I'm trying to figure out why they did this. And I don't know if they're... If he's being showcased for a trade, if they're trying to see if he can take the spot of someone else who could be traded. I thought maybe he was covering an unknown injury, but considering everyone played in Chicago, I don't think so. Or just straight up rewarding him for his AHL play. What do you think, Matt? I I think it's uh, more basic where they're just, uh, you, you've been kicking butt. Here's your cup of coffee in the NHL. So that way you can see what it's like so you can take it back to the A when the time comes so that way you can take the next steps that you need to to be up here full time. And I I feel the same way with Phillips. Like, I don't think we've seen the end of Phillips up here this season. 
Um, and I think that like when Phillips does get recalled, uh, that he will be deployed as like a regular player, not just, um, you know, press box guy. And I think that like this team, it, how would you say by having them recalled early, uh, which Peltier, even though it's halfway through the season is still early. Um, it gives them more time to go and work on things down in the AHL. Uh, like we've seen Phillips basically scoring practically every game winning goal <laughs> ever since he got sent back down and, you know, he's becoming more of, like having more of a killer instinct, um, down on the farm and that, you know, if the flames are needing him to, when he gets a recall, to be that good quality secondary scorer guy, then, you know, you need him to work on, you know, basically you're not going to get a ton of opportunities here. You, here's your shot. You only have X number of shifts, go do something and, you know, be ready to capitalize on every shift, not just, um, whenever. And, and I'm, I'm not all that choked up that, um, they didn't put, Phillips, or sorry, that they didn't put Peltier in for this game. I think, you know what, sometimes, and we saw this even with Phillips. They brought him up and they sat him for, I think, at least one game, if one, not. Yeah, it was just the Columbus game, then they played him two more, and then that was it. Yeah, so, I mean, I can see, you know, maybe them saying, okay, we're going to sit him out and we'll play him next game. But I think there's probably two things here. I think part of it is definitely probably rewarding him for his play um, in the AHL. We'll see where he slots in the lineup to see if that's true. But I also think with him, with Phillips, I think the Flames know they have to make a trade. I mean, we've been talking about this since before the season started. They have to bring another forward. And I don't think that they're trying to showcase Peltier for that trade, but I think they're trying to figure out, do we have somebody that can cover whatever open spot we're going to have after that trade? Or do we need to acquire another asset to backfill? Yeah. And and I think with Phillips, with Peltier, they're bringing those guys up to to say, okay, if we just call one of these guys up, can we fill that spot? Mm-hmm. And that makes a lot of sense. And I, I think that's part of why they brought them up so early is to give them that flexibility. Because, like, if they – say, like, Phillips, uh, when he got his shot, like, if he had scored a goal or two in that uh, two games or, you know, contributed for one of them, um, that would have been a different situation than, you know, him going pointless in those two games. And it gives the team more of an opportunity to see, are you immediately right here, right now, ready to step in and play that role as effectively as a guy that slotted in that role? And if yeah. that's the case, then, you know, like say Peltier comes in this week and scores a handful of points, then he's not going to get sent down right away at least and i think you you're just gonna have to see like what's with them and then respond like do we need, need to go get player x like if peltier just slots in and is you know say with uh huberdo and Kadri, as you suggested and like all three of them go gangbusters and which could happen uh you know then you don't all of a sudden need to go get that second line forward and you can, you know, maybe go get a depth forward, uh, scoring forward instead. And well, you and, know, and just I'm your even, calculations from there. I'm even thinking like maybe they're working on a deal for a big name and they, and the question is, do we also have to then take back sort of a, a depth forward as well to fill a hole that we're going to have, or do we have to do a secondary trade to fill that hole? Yeah. Or can we fill it internally? And, and I think that to me is, is in my opinion, why they're bringing these guys up. I think you've got to see what you have there at the NHL level. You have to make sure that you have, you know, you know what you've got there and you understand what you've got there. And yeah, I just think that they, they want to know it's one thing to play in the AHL. And how often have we seen a guy in the AHL who looked good in the AHL and then, you know, doesn't look good when they come to the NHL. So Austin I think you've really, <laughs> Yeah, I, I think Zarnik's a great one. I, I can think of a handful of guys. So, you know, I'm not, I don't think Peltier is necessarily, if I was going to make that call right now, I don't think Peltier is the guy I 
call up. I think no, he still has like, some AHL time ahead yeah, of him. And it's like for every guy like Cam Atkinson, who's slightly undersized, that comes up and is just awesome, you probably have like 15 or 20 that just never quite pan out properly. So, it, you know, it, it's a, very much a wait and see on all of those guys. It's just, yeah. But I think it's... I think they're at a point where they just need to figure out what they've what got they have. there. Yeah. Yeah. No. And especially like, you know, like if say like the guys that have been struggling started actually playing like as advertised, then, you know, like this team moves from being like the quasi middle of the road playoff team, uh, like second, third seed in the Pacific kind of team to basically being talent wise on par with Vegas you know, and then you can add like, okay, well, might not be reflected in the standings, but hey, we're just as good as the elite teams in the West. Add if we're as if we are going for the cup, and you know, whereas if the Flames are just playing that middle of the road, we're kind of just average. You you don't need to go get the Tyler to fully like we did last year. And I think part of it too, also with guys like you were saying, like Monjapani struggling. I think there's a little bit of a a mental aspect of, you know what, these guys are going to take your spot. Yeah. Oh, for sure. And, like, you look at Manjapane and, you know, like, at the, like, frankly, for how he's playing, you know, his buyout this year is one-third of the contract. And as bad as that sounds, a $4 million player playing like a $4 million player is worth more than what Manjapane is bringing. And... And I'm not ready to say it's time to buy him out or anything no, like that. It's, I'm it's not like either, Markstrom. But... He's had one se- one bad season. No, I know. And it's one of those where you have options available to you. And it's one of those where, you know, like if this kind of thing persists, all, you know, just like when the Flames had James Neal, like they didn't expect him to, you know, Mr. Consistent, like 25, 30 goal guy to just fall off the face of the earth, but he did. You know, and sometimes guys do just fall off and don't recover. And, you know, the Flames need to have all options on the table. And it's just tough because, you know, it's unfortunate because, like, I genuinely like most of the guys on the team and want them to be successful. And they're just not doing what they need to. And it's, you know, and... I think we're both maybe yeah. feeling a little bit down just because of this last Chicago game. I think if we take the Chicago game out, it hasn't been a, a bad week for the Flames, but I think we're both feeling a little sorry for ourselves because of the Chicago game that just ended. Yeah, a little bit, but it, it's, yeah. This this team need, just, I think, needs a bit of a shakeup. Um, by the way, just as we're talking about uh, this, uh, do we... The Flames go back to the well uh, and contact Montreal for Josh Anderson. You know, I'm I'm not ready to talk trade yet. Yeah, I, it's just I've you know the, the Flames have been linked to him in the past and 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 yeah. And I, I similarly, give, he's struggling with Montreal, so it's why I thought I'd bring. I want to give it a couple weeks before I start thinking about trade targets. All right. But let's uh, let's do what we promised everyone we were going to do this week, and let's take a look at our preseason predictions to see how we're doing right now, especially as we're feeling sorry for ourselves. Yeah. Spoiler alert, it's so not for, good. <laughs> for, for those of you that maybe weren't listening at the beginning of the season, every season Matt and I uh, do some predictions, and then we look back at them at the midpoint and then at the end of the season to see how, we, how we're doing. Matt, I think you might be surprised about some of these. So... The first one, will the Flames name a captain this year? And if so, who? I said n- not to start the year, but I think Lucic could be the captain by the end of the year. That's not happening anymore. And you said uh, no leadership by committee, but if they name a captain, it would be Kadri. Yeah. How are you feeling? How you feeling about that? Do you think Kadri gets to see? Uh, maybe next year. I can see I, next I think, year, yeah. I don't think that the Flames are going to name a captain. I think they need to basically have everything settle out. After what happened last off season, and I think just taking the year off of having a captain, you know, let Sutter be the captain now and uh, carry on uh, next year naming a captain one way or the other. I agree. 
Will Kadri, Huberto, and Uyghur be good enough for fans to forget about losing Kachuk and Goudreau? We both said yes. I think that Huberto and Uyghur have, um, have taken some time to get acclimatized here, but I'm not hearing what I was expecting when I answered this, which was the fans online kind of saying, what if? What if Goudreau was still here? What if Kachuk was here? So I think we we can safely say that we we're right on that one. Yeah, like the three guys are like they're not at their full capacity yet. Uh but like you're starting to see Huberto playing more like he has for the last like 8 years. So Yeah, I don't think anyone's pining for those other two guys to be back yet. No. Uh frankly, like I think everybody's just kind of mildly pointing at Gaudreau and laughing at this point for where Columbus is and his situation in general. Um, so like, uh, put it this way, if the flames were offered him for cheap, I wouldn't take him back at this point. Um, just because I don't see him adding anything special to the team. At if this the point. flames were offered him back, do you wait until the very last second to say no? Oh, of course you drag that right out until the last minute, but that's right. And then know. try to call him back the next day and say, Hey, would you change your mind? Yeah. Um, who will have a breakout season? I said, Andrew Mongepani. We just finished talking about how he's having the opposite. You said Dylan Dubé, and I think it's fair to say that so far, Dylan Dubé is definitely having a breakout season. Yeah. Uh, who needs to have a breakout season? And we both said Dubé. And I think, again, we're, we're seeing, I'm pleasantly surprised from what we're seeing from Dubé. Do I think he's a top-line winger? No, but I think he's he's doing well in the role he's been given. Yeah, he, he's always been one of those guys that he has all of the various parts that you know could make him a legitly good top six forward but he's never like really put all of them together in a cohesive package and like he's starting to uh, just like he was at the end of last year whether that fully manifests or he's just kind of that in middle six inconsistent when he's on he's great when he's not he's kind of just okay that's more the question we're at right now. And, and I don't think we're going to know that really until the end of the season and whatever playoff run this team goes on. Yeah. And even then, you know, like there's still like, we would still need a repeat next year to see. I can see him looking good in the regular season and then disappearing in the playoffs. Yeah. Or vice versa. Uh, frankly, like he seems like a player that, you know, can just go on that streak where like for, like a Fernando Pisani type streak where he's just awesome uh, for a playoff run where it's like, okay, that guy exists and now he's awesome. Well, there's a name I haven't yeah. thought of in a while. Yeah, exactly. And, <laughs> you know, and it's one of those, he has all the abilities to do so. It's just, um, you, you never know what you're going to get. And until there's more consistency in his game and deployment, game in game out uh and like the type of game he plays in each game well i don't think this prediction was really meant to be you know is he going to be a top six player of me on out but i think we can say that even if he you know even based on where he is he's definitely having a breakout season oh for sure it's just it'll be interesting to see like if like because when he's playing well uh like you saw tonight like he threw that really good body check that was randomly called a boarding penalty i still don't agree with that call but um you know when he's engaged physically like that though uh he tends to play at his best and but that physicality just isn't always in his game so like if he gets consistent with that you know it'll help to see exactly where he's at but you know let's just that's say a, coming into this season i would not have expected him to get time on the first line no uh, and i could see it but it would be a if x didn't happen or y or z and to be frank none of those things actually did happen so he did get a shot and credit him he took that opportunity in his run with it thus far who will struggle this season? I said Michael Backlund. I think we can both agree Backlund has not been struggling. And you no, thought, he's been awesome. And you thought Noah Hannafin. And more so than Backlund. <laughs> but but I, uh, I, would, I wouldn't I, say that he's struggling, uh, no, though. No, uh, he's 
been adequate. I neither based good on, or bad. Based on where the team is and what this team is this year, I don't think that Hannafin is struggling any more than anybody else. No, he's right down the middle on that, and could be better, but could also be a lot worse. Who will pleasantly surprise us? I said Kevin Rooney, and I don't even think he's pleasantly surprising Wrangler fans right now. <laughs> no. I should look uh, up his stats. I don't even know what he's doing down there. Uh, bad. Very, very bad. <laughs> as effective um, for them as he was for us. <laughs> so I, I think I definitely get that one wrong. Maybe he'll come back in the second half, and I'll finally get this right by the end of the year. But right yeah. now he's played 12 games with the Wranglers. He has two goals and two assists. Um, and six penalty minutes. You thought Jonathan Huberto. Yeah. I and mean, to me, I think I I think we're expecting Huberto to come in as the top guy. And I'd say at this point, I, I would say after 41 games, you're probably not quite there yet. No. Would you uh, agree this with is, that? Yeah. And I think that, like, this is one of those that when we get to that end of the season, it will, I will be right on that one but it's just not there yet. And you're starting to see him being more comfortable and like firing good passes that are actually hitting the targets and like the team's starting to play cohesively with him instead of him trying to feather those passes through and like the guy's just not in the right spot, that kind of thing. So we'll see. I think I'm going to take, I think I'm going to take the loss in that one right now. There's no way. Yeah. That- as long as Uber comes. goes in the NHL, I think I, I win that one. <laughs> yeah. Um, Who will be the Flames' top point getter? We both said Huberdeau, and right now Huberdeau is fifth in the team. But again, he's 10 points behind Lindholm. I think that will change by the end of the year. Yeah. Uh, I I could see Lindholm and him being close at the end of the year, but I think it'll slightly edge out for Hoops. Who will be the first call-up? And we do this by forward and defense. <clears throat> Matt, you were pretty close. Uh, I said Clark Bishop for forward because I thought they'd sort of use him as the extra body. And and uh, defenseman, I thought Mackey or Pullman. Well, um, I was not right there. Mackey's actually been here. Pullman, I don't think, has ever come close. No. Um, and you said Zahorna and Gilbert. And I looked. Technically, according to the NHL website, D. Simone was called up a few minutes before Gilbert, or at least the paperwork made it to the league before Gilbert. Because they were both called up at the same time, so yeah, I don't know. Maybe maybe a technical loss there for you. It's like an overtime loss. Maybe we'll give you one yeah. point. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, by, I'm the, zor- by the tiniest of hairs. <laughs> That's right. Um, will a call up be able to take a full time roster spot? We both said no. I would say at this point, Zahorna still hasn't taken a full time roster spot. Yeah, and I could see. Um, like at the end of the year, uh, either Pelte or Phillips or both potentially taking a spot, um, depending on how they play as the the season, especially because of how good they've been in the A, that I could see them like earning a spot. Uh, but th- that's, you know, I mean, we have you, 41 you, games to go. If and- you have to play 25 games to be an NHL rookie uh, or to be, you know, eligible for the Calder trophy i would say that you'd got to play at least 25 games to be classified a full-time NHLer. yeah uh, i could see that and uh how would you say i will give this caveat like say they only play like 20 games which is basically the trade deadline on if they're producing at a commiserate level um with where their lineup spot is so like if they're being a second line forward and they're doing second line numbers i would still count that even though like there might be like five games under the limit okay so why don't we say that if they're on the team by the trade deadline they count yeah if they you know if they're called up for the last 10 games but they're playing consistently for 10 games that's not being a full-time end chiller. no i agree um so yeah no i i think that'd be fair uh who's the first flame traded as of now Nobody's been traded, and that was your. You thought no roster player gets traded. I said they'd probably trade the right to Shillington if he doesn't come back. I don't think that's happening. Are you still fairly confident that no roster player gets traded? Um, the only w- way I would see a roster player leave is if uh, the Flames are going big game hunting and they need to include Lucic's dollars just to make it work. Um, 
that would be be pretty much the only way I could see. Because, uh, like, the Flames, I don't see trading a defenseman off. Uh, I could see them adding a defenseman, but I don't see losing one. And uh, for group-wise, uh, you'd be trying to push guys down the lineup. So unless they're adding... Or unless um, they're trying to do some sort of a hockey trade. Yeah. Um, unless it's, like, how they, like, included uh, Pitlick last year just to, you know... Are we calling was... Pitlick a roster player, though? Well, at the time, he technically was cap wise. So. He was on the roster, but he don't. He wasn't really a Calgary Flame. I'd forgot he was on this team. True, but you know, like you could see Rooney getting included in a deal. Possibly yeah, I wouldn't call to, Rooney a roster player, though. No, but he's on somebody's he, he, roster. He counts for the cap, so okay. I count that as a roster player. Okay. Do the Calgary Flames win the Battle of Alberta? We will both said yes. Actual answer: No. No. Where will the Flames finish the regular season in the Pacific Division? We both thought first. Still, th- still fairly confident with that. Um, because the Flames' schedule is basically like more than two thirds deadbeats the rest of the way. I think that they still have a very good chance at it, but they can't do what they did tonight anymore. <laughs> um, at this they, point, I, I how would you say I? I think they will finish either first or second in the division. I you know just because I don't see Seattle keeping it up all year and L.A. is not good enough I think um, and L- Edmonton I don't see rebounding at all I think they're gonna just fade actually even further um, but you know I don't uh, I don't think they're gonna beat Vegas at this point um, it it largely will depend on if the Flames can get on a heater due to playing lots of bad teams and Vegas is like their easy part of their schedule was the first half. Um, the, now their schedule is actually one of the toughest remaining. And, you know, it's one of those where, you know, like they've already fallen it's possible. back quite I'm a just ways. Saying, I, I yeah. don't think it's going to happen. Yes, it's possible. No. I, I'm, I'm not confident with that prediction anymore. No. Uh, I don't think the Flames are going to run away with it, but like it could be a race that will be decided in April. The Flames' regular season points. Right now they're at 46. If we just double that and assume they do the same numbers in the second half, that gets to 92. I'd said 120. You said 124. I think we probably overshot that for this year. The, well, I think we were both expecting this team to not have Markstrom be bad. For, for sure. Yeah, but I guess know, just looking at where we're at halfway through, I think yeah. 110 is probably the highest we could go. Yeah, like I, I think like if uh, Markstrom was playing at like last year's Markstrom's level, we're at where Vegas is now, in which case our predictions could be actually viable uh, for uh, the points that we had described, especially with the second half being weak teams, but, um, we just haven't got the goaltending. So, you know, I, I think anything in the 100 to 105 range is probably where they're headed. Um, we'll see. How far will the flames go in the playoffs? I said, Western conference finals. You said Stanley cup finals. You still confident with that one? Um, because of the fact that our division is bad, um, I could see either of those still being a factor. Y- you look at the uh, central division, like their whole division is bad. Um, like Dallas is okay, but like as we saw them in the playoffs last year, like they have not gotten that much better than they were a year ago, other than Jake Ottinger has actually played the entire regular season. And. Yeah, like I don't see them being any much more difficult. Uh, I just think that Calgary's issue right now is goaltending, and I don't think Vladar is the solve to take you to the Stanley Cup Finals. No, and my hope is that by the time that the playoffs roll around, that and like this is part of the reason why, like I was so strongly advocating for Vladar to start a lot um, over the next month or so, is to also give Markstrom just an actual break. So that way, like, his total games played number remains low-ish. So that way, like, if he does turn it around in March, April, then, you know, like, he'll be fresh for the playoffs instead of, you know, being run down. And, you know, especially with him being 
playing poorly and him being run down. You know, like, that was, I think, part of why he played so poorly tonight is that he's basically been starting every game again. And, you know, he needs more balance, and he's not getting it. And it's not fair to him or Vladar, frankly, at this point. And the Flames will go as far as their goaltending takes them, but, you know, it's hard because you look at how, like, System wise, how they're playing and like how they're able to shut teams down defensively, uh, limiting their shots, limiting their chances. Like, this team has the recipe for being successful in the postseason. It's just, uh, yeah, it's just executing it. And, you know, it. We're getting used to as Flames fans seeing that what's on paper is noise, what's on the ice for us. Well,. That that's the thing. Like we're seeing on the defensive side of it that they are actually executing as well as, uh, you know, on paper. And you know, like today's game was a bit of an aberration in terms of how many high danger chances that they were giving up. But like the amount of shots that they were giving up and chances in general has been really stunted for the other teams. And it's like if Calgary can figure out a way to have their goaltending be adequate and, you know, there some movement up front where they're actually generating a little more offense. Like this team will be virtually impossible to beat. It's just getting all the ducks in a row uh, to actually, you know, have that culminate at the right time. And like this team could be a very deadly team. It's just that they have to, work together in order to accomplish that and we're seeing We've been saying that for a few years though true uh let's see let's see it, what happens it, feel, it let, feels it, i just want to say that like it feels a little different this year because um like the flames were never really good at like limiting uh teams in the third period uh specifically uh in the past like it was pretty much trade chance for chance but like over the last like 15 games or so like the flames have really locked down the other teams in the third period uh by and large once or once in a while not so much but like generally like the other teams are getting very few shots very few scoring chances and you know like if they're able to keep that kind of play up which you know shouldn't be that much of a problem it, it's just one of those things it, it seems like they're getting more of the recipe right it's just not getting everything going at the same time and we you know we're running long so i don't want to have this debate now but we can do it next week if you want i don't think that in my opinion i don't think this year is all that different i think we're seeing a lot of the same things we've seen with the calgary flames for years it's one thing or another and to me it's just it's more of the same but we can have that debate next week if you want yep will daryl sutter win the jack adams again we both said yeah. yes. I'm not. I'm not as confident with that right now. No, I, I. I would severely doubt that at this. Point. I don't know who will, but I don't think it'll be Daryl. Yeah, I. I think that honestly, uh, like if Winnipeg keeps their stand points in the standings, uh, and you know, is like one of the top teams in the Central, I think Rick Bonus gets it. Frankly, could be. Will G? Will Brad Treliving win GM of the year? Uh, I still think yes, just because of the calamity that literally was unprecedented in NHL history that he had to face. And the fact that the team's not a tire fire, (laughs) you know, like as bad, you know, as critical as we have been, like this team is not near where Chicago is. And like this team could have been, uh, had the GM not really pulled the, the flames chestnuts out of the fire and, you know, he, that's literally entirely on him. Like the fact that we're even talking about the playoffs is a minor miracle considering the situation that they were dealt. So, you know, it, it, yeah, I I still think that he has to get that trophy just because (laughs) like who else has done more? (laughs) It's true. Yeah. I can, I can still see him getting that. What about uh, Marshall for the Vesna? I think we're both probably at the point we said, we said no going into this. And I think we're probably both on that. Yeah, no, there are too many guys that are doing too well. And, you know, like put it this way, even if Markstrom played lights out from tomorrow forward, 
and like even like took over the like, shutout lead and this that the next thing i don't even think it gets a, a, one of the top three votes at this point just because of how bad his first half was we'll skip over the last couple here about the playoffs and we'll come back to those at the end of the year but that's our predictions so i think you know overall we're we're not doing as bad as you thought we might be yeah i thought you know uh just based off of recollections and with how this team's been kind of more middling than either of us was frankly expecting that, uh, yeah. Um, the fact that they're not doing too badly according to our predictions is actually a good sign and hopefully, uh, more positive things to come in the second half. Well, let's take a look at the next week and see how many positive things we think there will be. We'll recap um, our last week. Neither of us were right. I thought we'd win all three. You thought we'd lose to Winnipeg, win Chicago, New York. So neither of us gets a point last week. And this week, the Flames have three games in the docket till we talk next. Three road games. They play Tuesday at St. Louis, Thursday at St. Louis, and Saturday at Dallas. Those are the two St. Louis games are 6 p.m. start times. And note that on Saturday it's a 12 p.m. start time. So a noon game for us here in Calgary. Um, Matt, let me ask you two questions. What do you think we're going to see for the result this week? And where do you see Dan Vladar? Uh, I think we're going to actually sweep the week with wins. Really? Um, yeah. I think that they're going to respond after this. And I think a large part of why they're going to respond will be that number 80 will be in net. I think Vladar will get all three games, and I think that they'll win all three games. Interesting. Yeah. I Dallas or Dallas is going to be tough. St. Louis got some injuries right now. I think three is a reasonable prediction. I think that we're going to win the first St. Louis game because I think you're right. We're we're going to need that uh, response. I think Daryl's going to make sure the team's ready to respond. I think they're going to lose the second St. Louis game, just because I think that hanging around St. Louis might do St. Louis. I think is going to be more ready for them with Calgary hanging around for that long. And I think they will beat Dallas. So I'm going to say that we win Tuesday and Saturday. Uh, I think, you know, these guys used to travel and I just have to think that being in the same city for like what, four days in a row, it's going to mess with them a little bit. Yeah, it is a little odd, but you know, and thankfully like the flames after uh, like the, these three games, like the, uh, next week they're playing a couple of decent teams with Tampa and Colorado, but then like after that they have a very protracted stretch where they're playing a lot of mediocre teams, pretty much through the end of February. So, you know, if I'm Daryl Sutter, I'm probably saying to this team right now, "You lost Chicago tonight. You better not lose on the 26th." Oh no, uh, yeah, and I think that like I, I I'm pretty sure he's going to be saying that. Okay, you lost one on the road trip. Uh, that was your one. And, you know, uh, you, you better damn well be uh, from opening puck uh, drop right through the end minute ready to go for each of the remaining four because you weren't for this one. And, you know, we can't give away points like this. Well, let's hope they don't give away any points and let's hope you're right and the Flames can take six of six points this week. I think that's what they need and I think that's um, definitely what needs to happen here. So... Hopefully you're right, Matt, and they they ride Dan Vladar to three wins. Well, especially like over the next five games, including the first two next week against Nashville and Colorado, like St. Louis and those two teams, like they're all in that same wild card race that we are, and it's one of those where like likely if the Flames make the playoffs, that they'll be one of the three top teams anyway, uh, just because the Central's more talented than our division, but. Uh, you know, you, you can't be giving a, up, uh, four point games in four of the next five. Like you need to actually take some points from those teams that you're fighting for a spot with. Well, I think that does it for, uh, for this week. So we will talk to everyone next week and we'll see how the flames do. And if they can straighten out this road trip. And as always go flames, go fireside chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.